The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. A Challenger Lifetime Annuity can do more for portfolio outcomes. A combination of income streams, blending a Challenger Lifetime Annuity with other sources of retirement income, such as an account-based pension, means your clients can get the best of both worlds, guaranteed regular income for life, and access to capital as needed. Help more clients do more, live more, create more. Contact your Challenger BDM or visit challenger.com.au forward slash portfolio dash outcomes. For a retirement portfolio that can deliver more, read and consider the Challenger Lifetime Annuity, Liquid Lifetime, PDS and TMD from challenger.com.au. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I am back this week. Uh, I think last week's episode said I was on holidays. <laughs> I was just jammed for trying to record an episode. But today I have the pleasure of speaking with Josh Derrington. CIO at Alvia Asset Partners. Josh, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Now, it's always good to just get a bit of a, a bit of a start on maybe let's start on you know, what is Alvia Asset Partners first off, and then and then we'll kind of talk about your story. I think would be would be interesting certainly for me from from uh, from what I've what I've read about you. Um, but yeah, well, tell, tell us Alvia Asset Partners. What are you up to? Yeah. So essentially, we are an investment management firm that specialises in investing money for family offices. So wholesale clients, um, predominantly family offices, uh, of which one is my own. And I, I'm, you know, we can talk about family offices in general, but it's obviously very topical. You're reading and hearing a lot about the emergence of family offices, but um, yeah, we, we we manage money across multiple asset classes for family offices. Yep. And what about, so you've been doing it for, for a while. It's like, so some, you know, something that I read, you know, you, you spoke about your own kind of family office, whatever's yeah. happen, happening there. There's some, some family assets. And so you, you in a bit in the beginning, you were working on helping manage family assets and, and then you've gone to start your own business. Is that, can you tell us yeah, about that? Slide, um, yeah? yeah, sort of. And so basically, so I guess for most people in finance, I've come from an institutional background in finance. I, um, I, I guess institutional money manager didn't really, didn't really suit my style or my personality type. I think I, I struggled with the concept of managing to a relative benchmark that yeah. I didn't quite appreciate. Um, and I was more of an absolute return minded person. Um, I, I left the industry to, to try and do my own thing in business and, and was lucky enough to have some success, um, and, and sell a business and realize um, some capital, and it it forced me to really think about how I wanted to manage my own money, and what I thought would um, this was a blank piece of paper sort of moment, and how I could build a firm that suited me and my personality, and invest with some people that I knew, and I guess friends, yeah. and and fortunately enough, some other families have sort of bought into that philosophy, and that was sort of how asset Elvia Asset Partners came about. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, what was was the business that you made and, and, and sold? Was was that in and around investing, or was that something completely different? No, bizarrely, but bizarrely, completely outside of the investment world. Um, yeah. I a client had an, an asset, um, and they actually approached me um, before they went to a competitive process and said, "Josh, we think this your skill set and sort of temperament might suit this business." It was in the education sector, um, so my wife and I took that on. Um, <laughs> leveraged everything we had and sold our house and, and and had a go, and fortunately enough, it worked and we we learnt lots of lessons along the journey and and since then we've done a couple of other things in private markets. Um, I started a healthcare business with one of my best friends, which we sold part of to private equity. Um, I'm still sit on the board and invested in that business, but yeah, it, it it sort of it forced us to really think about what we wanted to do long term with our our own wealth and yeah. and yeah, as I said, other families have sort of bought into that philosophy. 
Mm. How how old are you? I'm I'm forty one. Um, yeah, yeah. You've done, yeah. You've done so much for forty one years old. Thanks, That's man. incredible. Yeah, good on you. So how, Actually, do you, no, no. how do you get and this? Is, how do you get that transition from? You know, you've you, you know you knew a bit about financial markets from from work. You yeah. obviously you've you know, gone and done something else and a success at that. You sold a business. You've made some money. You then turn your attention to kind of investing your own money. Essentially, how did how do you then go from investing your own money to getting other people to invest with you? How did like how does that transition happen? Yeah, I I just I personally thought there was a there was a gap in the market for really absolute return focused investing. Yeah, and I, I mean I just put it back to my own experience when I. When I go home to my wife at night, she doesn't ask how we performed against an arbitrary benchmark. It's true. She asks how we're going to afford the school fees. Um, so I just, I think we, we're we very selective around who we take on as clients. So we're, yeah. and I think the way we write and the way we present ourselves, you know, I, I get the lines of certain types of people and it, those types of people tend to be families that have had some sort of liquidity event of some description and are navigating that transition from, actively managing something, whether it be a business to a passive pool of capital. And it's just, a, it requires a totally different mindset. Yeah. But ultimately it comes down to the core of capital allocation, the asset, whether that be asset allocation in a passive environment where you, where you choose to place your capital or and or in a business where you're allocating capital, whether it be maintenance or growth capex. So it's, and I think a lot of people struggle with that transition from operating to investing um or that they believe they're very good at operating and therefore that makes them a great investor. Yeah. Um, and and that sometimes is, a lot of the times is not the case. I, I would imagine your own lived experience helps in that regard. Like I'm, I'm sure, and we, as we all do in, in, in financial advice, often you know we, mm. we're retelling stories of what we've done ourselves or what someone else has done that, that you've helped. I I would imagine you having done that yourself from being a kind of owner operator of a business mm-hmm. uh, to selling it to then managing you like you've done that transition yourself. I'd imagine yep. there's a bit of a degree of comfort in some of the families that you're working with that you've been through it yourself before. Do, would that be right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think. I mean, you go back to the, the everyone's read the Buffett letters. Um, he talks about how he is a better investor for the fact that he's been you know closely. No, operated inside a board and it had yeah. some insight into business itself. It's certainly and most of it's just lessons from making mistakes. Yeah. And I think from both perspectives, you're just you're managing risk. If you're inside a business, you're managing the risk. Um, you're navigating the messiness of a business and the humans and um trying to get them aligned around a, a story and a and a and a, a message and a vision. And it's the same Principle in times of in inside of investment portfolio, you're managing risk. You're clearly considering where the capital goes to generate the best returns for the least amount of risk, and thinking through opportunity costs. So, absolutely, it's made me a better investor. And it it's it's purely because I've made mistakes and I've yeah. learned from them and iterated. Um, so yeah, I it, it, I think and and perhaps families buy into that because they can see that we're not trading tickers. We're contemplating investments in businesses and and thinking about it with perhaps a a longer term mindset than the average person inside investment markets yeah so yeah, yeah. Mm. But like we we know, we deal with like in kind of retail world where i most of my financial advice uh, you know the clients and then and, and work sits you, you constantly come not constantly but you're kind of coming at, coming up against this idea of people that don't have any experience in financial and markets you know have never invested in in, in share markets before kind of see it they kind of liken it to gambling so i'm going to buy this yeah. stock and they're kind of just punting that to say that I'm, yeah. I'm trying to make a fortune it's like hang on you're actually becoming a part owner in bhp you're a part yeah. owner of that business now someone else is controlling and operating and running that business but you own part of the business you're not you, you're, yeah. you're you're buying into the long-term prospects of this business not punting on trying to make a fortune tomorrow and then selling it like it's not it's not the casino yeah, it's a pet peeve of mine. I don't know how we fix it, but yeah, that sort of gambling fallacy when it comes to markets. And it's funny, you'll see same people who are happy to walk into a casino and and, and gamble 
and then relate that back to what they do inside investment markets. And it just it's it's frustrating. But as you said, it's it you you, you what a privilege to be able to participate in an investment market where you can literally offer no active involvement to the business, but go along for the ride. Yeah. Um, it's fantastic, and yeah. and you get to do that while you enjoy your time with your family. I think it's yeah, it's an yeah, it's underappreciated privilege. I like the way you put that. I like that. Mm-hmm. Can we spend a bit of time talking about family offices? So I've never worked in a family office, uh, and I you know, I work as I said in a broadly retail focused a financial advice business. I I get the odd phone call from people that are that you know they. They, they're calling saying, oh, you know, we've got certain assets like this. I think we need a family office offering. What is a family office? Yeah, I I think it's it's becoming overused, but I also think they're they're emerging for a reason. I think there is there is clearly more capital around that is interested in buying things and most of them are operating businesses, which is creating a pool of capital for people who have the need to employ people to service that pool of capital. So whether that, so a family office is basically that. It's a passive pool of capital that has people in and around it doing things, whether it's if they're, and they're, they're, they're not all the same. They're, they're clearly very, very different and they come in different shapes and sizes. But yeah, whether that's administration, so employing accountants to help with reporting and managing these passive assets, whether it's property managers servicing the property asset allocation within a family office, whether it's private equity individuals representing representing them in their other investments outside of their core business, or it's investment managers like us, which serve a role for them um, around their capital. So it's yeah, it's a it's a pool of capital. It's probably been realised in the, you know whether it could be multi generational or it could be realised in the last ten years and it's their first iteration of the family office. Yeah. doing things with that pool of capital and managing risk and attempting to generate a, a real return over time to allow that capital to transition to the next generation inside the family. Yeah. But yeah, there's there, there's two types. So there's a single family office, which is exactly what I've described. And then there's multi-family office with offices, which basically service um, wealthy individuals who probably don't have the capacity to build their own single family office. Yes, so I hope so that makes can... sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you kind of got at, at the wealthier end, They've they've got enough money to employ these people directly: accountants, bookkeepers, yep. investment managers, lawyers, yep. whatever it might be. And so they're exactly. so they're employing people that might do like a lot of what an ordinary financial advisor does. But yeah, you're just yep. employed solely to work on that family. And then exactly. you know, that, that 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 middle one is where there's a group of families would come together, or there's a business that's built to support a group of families where there's. The accountants and the bookkeepers and the property managers, the investment managers, and all of these kind of things, but they're maybe just working with half a dozen families or something like that. They're working with a, a small number of families, yep. and then there's then there's the, the the financial advice type businesses where I work and, and a lot of listeners work, where you might work with fifty or a hundred different clients, and they also have an accountant, and they also have a lawyer, and they also have a this and a and, and a that. Yeah, yeah. exactly that. Yeah, got it. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I, yeah. As I said, I. Before, as I said before, we, we pressed record. You certainly hear a lot about family offices and, and what are they doing, and certain people calling our office you know, suggesting that they maybe they need a family office offering. Uh, and it's just yeah, interesting to see what what the differences are that are out there. So, in, in terms of your investing, um, you know, like what are you doing? What are you seeing in terms of trends? Like, what's yeah, what what are you up to with with the investing that you're doing? Yeah, so as I sort of. Um... As I mentioned, we're, we're absolute return focused. That doesn't mean we we like to short a whole lot of things. It just means we think through our portfolios in terms of generating real returns. So we don't. We're pretty unconstrained. We don't. We don't abide by benchmarks. Um, even though we have we have an investment committee that's overseen by the ex state head of QIC, we who's very big on governance and and still brings benchmarks to our attention. It's not how we invest. But we think about equity being equity, whether it's private or it's um, listed. Mm. We think about buying high quality businesses and and ideally getting them at a reasonable price point allows us to generate a decent return over time. We also think in, in multi asset classes, so we, we we do believe in asset allocation being a legitimate risk management tool, but we but we take it a step deeper than that. There's the point where we um, 
we we have I have my own portfolio managers who have worked in institutional environments. We have analysts. We we are prepared to do active work on businesses. So we think we have a, a an edge. And whether it's whether it's our analytical ability, probably not. It's more just our ability to control our temperament and and manage your portfolio accordingly. So um, yeah. So long the short, we we run a multi asset club class portfolio which includes alternatives fixed income some REITs Aussie and international equities and then we very selectively selectively will add um, private market opportunities from time to time and not not a huge number it might be one a year where we think it's a really clear opportunity to generate um, you know out the outsized returns basically yep. and we'll do that with inside an asset allocation um Mandates effectively, so, like on on the on the topic of REITs, for, for, yeah. for example. So yeah. there's you know, like listed you know, li- listed REITs in Australia, US, yeah. where, where, wherever the, wherever yeah. they may be. So there's something like that. Are you also yeah. getting into like buying the 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 physical property, the shopping centre down the road, like the shopping centre down the road from me, Woolworths bought that for fifty one million dollars or something. Yeah, is yeah. is that is that the kind of thing that you would you would look at? pulling yeah. other groups like you to, to purchase something like that? Exactly that. So we will yeah. pull very selectively. I, I, yeah. This, we are not we are not property specialists, so mm-hmm. you, we need a serious margin of safety to get comfortable with our sort of generalist ability in this space, or we need to co-invest with someone who we think has real institutional um, yep. ability. So re- recently we bought, we took a stake in an office tower, which we thought was distressed, and we did that with an institutional partner. So yeah. We um we, we we I think we took a twenty percent stake in the building. That's that's the sort of thing we'll do from time to time. But I think prior to that, we hadn't done a property um thing for sort of five years. So yep. um yeah, it's very selective on that sort of stuff. Yeah. And Nick, can you talk a bit about uh like like asset allocation? So you know, mm-hmm. we and I suspect a lot of other financial yeah. advisors, our clients have an asset allocation. But the way that we're managing an asset allocation is a certain amount in cash, fixed interest. Yep. You know, Aussie equities, overseas equities, those kind of things. Is that the type style of asset allocation that you're managing, or is it a, or is it more detailed than that? Like you have an asset allocation to private equity, you have an asset allocation towards listed equity because you're trying to manage liquidity and things like that. Like, what level does your asset allocation go? Probably very similar to what you guys do, and I, and I think yeah. a lot of people tend to overcomplicate asset allocation because, yep. and part of the time, I think they're justifying their own existence. Um, but I. I think about exactly the same way you do. We we run a static asset allocation across our model portfolios. Um, we just choose to do it in, inside our equity portfolios. We manage those portfolios directly. So to cut out that extra layer of fees or uh, employing multiple active managers, we will do that ourselves. And then um, we also run an alternatives portfolio, which is is largely illiquid. Um, is largely liquid, I should say, and has traditionally been uncorrelated with our portfolios. So, and I think probably the only difference for our wholesale clients is they're prepared to be a little bit more tactical in their asset allocation. So they're prepared to make or give us discretion to make more to tilt, basically. And we think you can generate some alpha doing that. Um, yep. So they give us some flexibility to do that. But ultimately, underlying it, it would be very similar to the asset allocations you, you mentioned. Yeah, and and so are there are there various investment options for want of a better description that you that you have? It's not just uh, we we have this one this this one kind of fund yeah where everything's going into, and then you and then you're allocating across an asset allocation. There's there's different investment options. Yeah, so sort of. So we'll run SMAs, and then we have yeah. a unitized fund, and predominantly the unitized fund has been used for more second third generation clients where they probably don't have. The capital to buy into our, our SMA's more diversified offering, so we we have a fund, but for for our traditional client, they will give us a mandate, maybe twenty twenty million dollars, and they will dictate to us what their absolute return hurdle is. So whether it's seven eight percent, let's use that number, then we will build and customize our asset allocation around our SMA's to execute on that hurdle. Does that make sense? Right. So you yeah. so you manage so you then so, you're managing it on a is it like on a client by client basis on a the twenty yeah. million dollar mandate, for example, yeah. rather than yeah. hey, give we'll put your twenty million dollars into our our 
bigger fund. Exactly. And yeah. we deliver the return that we deliver for everyone. It, it's it's more client by client basis. It's client by client, but the underlying assets are the same. It'll just yep. be different different weightings to the sure. the, the asset classes. So we yep. don't we don't run this is our conservative balanced. We don't our clients are sort of they're fairly sophisticated, so they don't their the risk profiling is a different it's a more of a conversation about this is our whole of wealth. This is how we're thinking about your how you're gonna operate for us. This is the return we want you to generate with the least amount of risk. Yep. We'll go and build that build that asset allocation for them. Yeah. And 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 the SMA is is that that's all listed asset fears. Predominantly, yeah. A lot, a, a lot of that is, is listed, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yep. So and and the way we do, we will try and manage as much directly as we can. And inside our circle of competence, we think we can do that ourselves when it comes to equities. Outside of that, we will employ managers that are that are prepared to do something, yeah, or, or just do something differently that we would never be able to do ourselves in house. Yeah, I'm interested in how you come across um, opportunities in the, in that kind of private space, mm-hmm. private businesses. So, mm-hmm. where do where do they come from? What do you? How do you filter out the good from the bad? Like, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we see lots of bad. Um, <laughs> I think we we've got a reasonable network now where I think people know what we do and what we don't do. We know a lot of a lot of accountants, a lot of lawyers, um, a lot of corporate advisors as well. So we're prepared to go in a competitive process um, if if we think we can offer some value. We've we've got some we've had experience in in a few fair few healthcare investments. So people will come to us with healthcare assets. Yeah. Um, that also where we get we get proactive opportunities come across our desk is the fact that we're prepared to take minority positions. So we're prepared to be a little bit different to your traditional private equity that wants to, no offense, I've got a lot of friends in private equity. They they just have a very um, systemized process of you know taking a majority position, taking control, navigating a three-year window, exit planning from day one, 100-day plans, et cetera, et cetera. We just do it differently. So I think that suits a lot of founders and perhaps advisors who know us know that we might align with a certain founder. So we've just been very, you know, very open around our communication about what we like and what we don't like, and we're probably prepared to buy more boring businesses um, than most, you no know, private equity who uh, want to invest behind tailwinds and and thematics. And we don't really think that way. We just like we like good boring businesses that generate cash flow and can turn up, and that we can go into day one with not not having to provide technical expertise, but perhaps provide some expertise around capital allocation and thinking through how are they going to transition the asset at some point in time in the future? What is what does the org chart look like? Is it is it a family business? Do they need to bring some people outside of the family into the business? Those sort of things. So, mm. yeah. yeah uh, you know, you, and you touched on it there because like if you, mm. once you're starting to get into this private, you know, private business world, world mm. Like depending on how much of a stake you take in that business, you may end up being in a position where you have to join the board and you have to kind of take control in operating and running that business. And so yeah. on the one hand, you're running your own business and your own fund and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you really want to? Do you have the expertise to actually take on responsibility for you happen to invest it in this business, but no. now because you've invested in it, you're now responsible for totally. the, the outcomes of it versus and- versus just being a, a, a minority holder. That yes, and you kind of in this kind of longer term investment for the you know, maybe the, maybe the cash flows that come from it. Yeah, and if I've had to, or any of us have had to get intimately involved, it means there's been a mistake. So yeah, it means that something's gone astray. We've misjudged the people involved. I think the big thing with private capital that perhaps people that work in listed markets don't appreciate it's it's a human game. You are mm. you are really genuinely partnering with people, and if you get that wrong from the outset. You know, that's you, you can spend a lot of time trying to 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 fix it. So um, a lot of it is just it's it's almost it's it's part psychology, getting your head around. Can you trust these people, and can they work together? And are they are they the type of people because things will go wrong. They always do in business. Um, are they the type of people that can deal with adversity and they're resilient enough? Can they take feedback? Um, are they willing to listen? Those sort of things. So it's it's different to looking at a business through the context of listed markets where, you, you know, it's this nice, clean, quantitative process buried up with some qualitative 
ideas around moats and competitive advantage. And I mean, they're all really interesting things to talk through, but when it's private markets, that's why I say you can only do one and we might be able to do one a year because it's a whole lot of work. Yeah. And that, like, in a completely different world, like a completely different lens to be thinking about versus what you know, by and large, most of the, you know, financial advisors would be looking at, you know, for even those that some of them don't even go down to the direct stock level, but where you are going down to the direct stocks yet, you know, you're looking at some research from all of these different research houses and yep. drawing your own conclusions on it. That's a very different uh, thought pattern to yeah, actually buying into someone's small business. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. yeah, completely different. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, how do you, so, so you kind of commented there about, you know, it's more of the maybe boring, reliable stuff rather than the, rather than some of the, the fun, exciting trends at the, at the moment. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how it's, how, how it's all been going for you from a returns perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's been fine. I, I would say yeah. um, we're not, we're not value investors, but we're certainly very valuation minded. I think yeah. um, that value investing is almost a dirty word these days, but I, I'm still a believer that value matters. Um, we just we just think through quality first, and then uh, and then apply you know pretty strict criteria and valuation. So it means it means we run more concentrated portfolios, and it means we sit on a lot of a lot of uh, businesses or stocks for a long time before we invest in them, waiting for the right price or, or waiting for an event to to create a price. Um, but yeah, no returns are good. I think I'm always. I'm away. Get nervous when returns are good because it means um, the expectations build and it attracts the wrong people to our business. So yeah. I'm always thinking that's great, but that's all in the revision mirror. It's um, it's and I'm I'm more, I'm more conscious of yeah, what's the, what are the risks that are in our portfolio today as opposed to returns. But yeah, no, it's going okay. And how do you like? How do you manage that? Like, how, how do you manage the risk of the portfolio? Like, what are you? How are you dealing with that internally? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So when I'm fund, fund, running a fund is different to the SMAs. I think obviously the same philosophy is the, is the biggest thing. Are we sticking to our knitting? Are, are we, are we doing the right amount of work? Are, are we, are we buying? I mean, risk management is a lot about price and we, we run inside our, almost all our portfolios run IRRs. So we know we get a very clear sense from our portfolio around what, our expectations are, and when I see like at, and presently, probably our IRRs are, you know, they're getting they're getting close to the point where we we probably add we're adding more cash. Mm. So yeah, we did, and risk is interesting. Asset allocation is 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 a great means of risk management. And when you're running a a more concentrated portfolio inside our our fund, we have to think about risk differently. So we think about it in terms of what does this what role does this position play inside the portfolio? So we, we break it down to compounding businesses. Obviously, everyone wants to own great compounders mm. and hold them forever. That's a that's a really great way to generate a return, but sometimes they're just too expensive to hold forever. Um, so we, we complement that with other, almost goes to the Peter Lynch style of investing where we, we have asset value propositions, we have cyclicals. We just don't ever fall in love with our cyclicals or our asset plays. Um, and then we hedge with very selective, you know, whether it's just simple hedges like owning treasuries or owning a bit of gold, yeah. so because it's it's obviously it's harder to rebalance inside a fund than it is inside an asset allocation framework. So, yeah. um, constantly thinking about having liquidity to use when the market, um, you know, gets nervous for whatever reason. Yeah, and how do you like? Do you do you find you you, know, you might meet with potential? families or so forth that are, that are interested in investing in you but do you end up turning people away like is, is there does, does that play out yeah, at all yeah it's definitely it sounds um, like you obviously you know there's a particular type of family that you suit and yeah yeah can you talk about that yeah definitely uh, you, i mean you have to be prepared to send people away for the if, yeah. if they're there for the wrong reasons and they're there for a quick win mm. um and you, you can get that sense pretty quickly or i can now um you know, do they have that sort of trading gambling mindset, which, which you referenced? And are they chasing our recent returns, or are they genuine believers in compounding over the long term? Because, I mean, I, we, we write a quarterly, and I spoke about this. Getting your clients right is more important than getting your asset allocation right, um, from some perspective, because yeah. you just want you want them to be there and buying into your philosophy when the market 
and we run this process of clients. I mean, when the markets or your portfolio is down 20% and you're asking them to, to perhaps deploy new capital or you're trying to rebalance and they're being reluctant, like that's the worst outcome for us. We mm. that we need to be able to trust in our process and we need our clients to trust in our process. If they're not, if they're not willing to, then they're probably not the right client for us. So we write a lot and we write quarterly um, and that almost creates this self-filling, bring, and bringing the right people to us and the wrong people just will not read what we write <laughs> or buy into our, our style. So yeah, yeah. super important. Or they, or they read it and they and they don't like it, so then they don't. Yes, they, they don't. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that that kind of education piece that you're kind of referring to hmm. is that are, are you are you doing that like directly with with the end client, like the the family whose money it is, or is there someone in between, like an advisor of sorts in between? Yeah, what, what does that look like? Yeah, it varies. Um, yeah. Some some of the families have people in place um, yeah. that we deal with it. We still deal with the patriarch or matriarch or the next generation down from time to time. Yeah. If they have skill sets and I'm a big, big believer in bringing, bringing the next generation through and, and getting them to appreciate how this all works mm-hmm. because, and that, and that selfishly, that's about protecting our business as well, because if they don't understand what we're doing at some point in time, we've devoted, you know, some, some of these cases, 10 years to these people um, who could turn, yeah, you know, turn us away when that when those assets transition. So yes, um, but I also just a believer in financial literacy and improving elements um, across society, and especially in some of these larger families. We, we, you make the presumption that they're very um, sophisticated and literate, and and in some cases they're just not because mum and dad have been so busy inside a business for so long they just haven't had the time. Um, so I'm going off on a, on a tangent, but um, no. It's but, right. It, yeah. it, it, it's kind of a in that kind of wholesale sophisticated investor, um, mm-hmm. you know, de- definition mm-hmm. that you know mm-hmm. there, there's less less disclosures and bits and pieces that you need to have for certain people with certain assets or certain income. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, just because someone's operated a business in a particular field and they've sold it for fifty million dollars and they got all this cash now, yeah, doesn't necessarily mean that they're a sophisticated investor. They happen to have done really well in operating their business and they've had this liquidity event. Great. Yeah. But for them to then turn around and and assume, and and it certainly sounds like you don't assume, but for them mm. to certainly to turn around and it and for someone in your position to assume that they know what you're talking about or know what you're doing or how you're managing the portfolio, it can be two completely different worlds for them. Which is you know what you were saying right at the very start. But yeah, I, I like this kind of education mindset that you've got about what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. So where do your where do your clients come from? Or how do they find yeah, you? Mixed bag. Um, most of them are client referrals. Yep. Um, to be honest, I I think yeah, it's almost all word of mouth. We don't do a lot of marketing. We do a little bit of PR, but very rarely. Yeah, it's it's mostly people have had a reasonable experience and told some friends about the service they've got, or it's you know it's a traditional path through for an accountant or a lawyer who, who thinks we might align with the values of a someone who's had a liquidity event. Yeah, and I'm sure that the quarterly, the writing that you said that you do on a quarterly basis, I'm sure that helps in there. That's yeah, a little bit. That, that's yeah. it. That's you know probably an easy intro. Someone it's easy for someone to share that with their friend or their client yeah. or whatever. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah. Josh, if it, if anyone wants to, we might kind of round it out now. But but does it for anyone that wants to uh, reach out to you, find out a little bit more about the yeah. business? Where can they where can they find you? How can anyone get in touch? Yeah, I mean, the, probably best to start with the website, Elvia, yeah. Elvia Asset Partners, um, and you can read some of the the insights and get a sense of how we think. And then, um, obviously, oh, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone. But we, we've got a reasonable sized team now. We have a we have a CEO who, who came across recently, so um, allows allows me to run the investment team and 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 do a little bit less of. Um, you know, the initial client engagement, he's he's pretty good yeah. at filtering out the people. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, no, nice. And forever wherever wherever anyone's listening to this, we'll put some some links to your to the to the website and you know your LinkedIn page and all of these kind of things. Yeah. So oh, awesome. thank you. Contact if they want. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. No worries, appreciate it.